first name dropped in the biblical book of Genesis? The Garden of Eden was said to be an earthly paradise. But was Eden just a religious myth, or was it a real place? And if it was real, or even merely based on an actual location, where might it be? Well, today we're going to take a look at where the Garden of Eden actually could have been. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other topics you would like to hear about. Okay, I can see paradise by the dashboard light. So, the good news is, Genesis has a description of the Garden of Eden's location. Uh, Genesis, the Bible book, not the Sega console or the prog rock band. The bad news is, that description isn't quite as specific as you might hope. According to the Bible, Eden was located at the head of a major river that divided into four smaller rivers to water the garden. The smaller rivers were called the Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates. The Tigris and Euphrates are easy enough to identify because they still exist, and the term head encouraged many scholars to place Eden in the mountains of Turkey, where those two rivers originate. But in ancient Hebrew, the word head didn't refer to the beginning of a river. Rather, it indicated a place where a river intersected with other bodies of water, which would imply that the heads of the four rivers were all in the Persian Gulf. And while the sites of the Gihon and Pishon River remain obscure, many biblical geographers have argued that the former corresponds with the Karun River in Iran, and the latter within the now dry Wadi Batin River system, that once drained from the fertile central area of the Arabian Peninsula into the Persian Gulf. If this is the case, it would place Eden at the top of the Persian Gulf, in the area of the Mesopotamian marshes. Uh, possibly. The Bible kind of stinks at giving directions. In recent years, the remains of 60 settlements from the Ubaid period, which was about 7,500 years ago for those of you keeping score, have turned up around the edge of the Persian Gulf. Aside from stone houses that were so well built they outlasted the rise and follow the vast majority of human civilization, these sites hold evidence of long distance trade networks, elaborately decorated pottery, domesticated animals, and wood from one of the oldest known boats in the world. Man. Bet you thought your grandpa held that title. That boat's been sitting on blocks in his driveway since the Carter administration. Based on those findings and others, it's now generally believed that the Ubedians were likely more technologically advanced than the people in the Nile River Valley at the time. There weren't any pharaohs around yet, but if there were, we imagine they would have been inconsolably jealous. Unlike nearby sites in Yemen and Oman, archaeologists in the Persian Gulf haven't found any stone tools that identify preceding Paleolithic settlement. This has led to a new theory that the evidence of Paleolithic settlements which predate the Ubadians is missing because it's all underwater. Until 8,000 years ago, a landmass the size of Britain existed within the Persian Gulf, which has to make you wonder how humanity could misplace something that big. That landmass was fed by four rivers and a network of underground springs, making it a lush paradise that was able to support a population of hunter-gatherers. That population had traveled up from Africa as far back as 100,000 BCE. They sought refuge in the lush Persian Gulf oasis during an ice age. And it wasn't the fun kind of ice age with Ray Romano. It was the world-changing kind that reduced the surrounding lands to vast deserts, possibly also with Ray Romano. One way to interpret the Garden of Eden story is as a tale of tension between two competing groups who clashed in the area of the Persian Gulf Oasis, sometime between 6000 and 5000 BCE. The first group would be the nomadic hunter-gatherers, who moved in and out of the Gulf region depending on weather conditions, which determined how much food would be available. The Ubadians were the second group. Their lifestyle and technology allowed them to stay in one place and form large settlements. This made foraging for food more difficult for the hunter-gatherers. After starving for a while, some of the hunter-gatherers became the first humans to discover the value of being a free agent, and defected to the Ubadian group. They took up farming and almost disappeared, except for one thing. Their stories of a simpler, more innocent time stayed with the combined group. These same stories were passed down until they were recorded on tablets by the Sumerians, who luckily, for future generations of historians, were very big on tablets. In the ancient Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh, the titular hero comes across an old man who tells Gilgamesh a story of how the god Ea instructed him to build an enormous boat to save himself, his family, and the seed of all living things. Starting to sound familiar to you Russell Crowe fans? The old man does as Ea instructs, and the gods create rains that last for several days, causing a great flood. 
When the rains subside, the man's boat lands on a mountain, and he sets loose first a dove, then a swallow, and finally a raven, which all find dry land. It sounds a lot like the story of Noah's Ark from the Old Testament, only that story long predates the Hebrew variant. The Hebrew weren't even the first ones to repurpose the tale. The Babylonians and Akkadians each had their own versions first. Everybody loves a good boat story. So did the flood really happen? Well, between 18,000 and about 6,000 years ago, as the Ice Age wound to an end, most of the ice melted off Canada and Scandinavia. Those areas were as big then as they are now. So you can imagine there was a lot of ice. It was like a wave pool at water country, but on a geological scale. This caused the sea level to rise all over the world. There's evidence at the Bosporos that 8,000 years ago, a massive deluge of water poured into the Black Sea in a short period of time. In a similar way, the Persian Gulf Basin, which at that time was little more than a large river fed by the Tigris and Euphrates, swelled with water that spilled in from the ocean, destroying the freshwater paradise of the Persian Gulf Oasis, and ultimately connecting it to the Gulf of Oman. Property values presumably took a hit, except in the ancient city of Ur. By the time the flood waters stabilized, the end of the Persian Gulf lay much farther north, putting Ur at the new shoreline. It was the end of Eden, but at least it was a seller's market. In Sumerian legend, the first man was created out of clay and blood as a servant for the gods, proving that even gods used recycled materials. The servants were created because the gods were tired of working the land. Oh, so that's the meaning of life. Man is portrayed in Sumerian art as working in their gardens in a state of nakedness, kind of like the biblical Adam. And in the tale of Adapa and the South Wind, the first man, Adapa, breaks the South Wind's arm after the South Wind overturned his boat on the Persian Gulf, which kind of sounds like the South Wind wrote a check it couldn't cash. Adapa is taken to the place of the gods, and while there, it's discovered that he has knowledge of the secret workings of heaven and earth, good and evil, and right and wrong. And because he already had this higher knowledge, the gods offer him food that would make mankind immortal. But the jealous god Enki tricks Adapa into not eating the food of death, cheating mankind of immortality. This, of course, has some parallels to the story of Adam in the book of Genesis. No one knows exactly where the Sumerians came from, but between 5500 and 4000 BCE, they occupied 10 city-states between the Tigris and Euphrates river system. Though these city-states were constantly at war with each other, they shared a common language and invented the first written language, the wheel, literature, law code, and complex mathematics. And just in case none of those impress you very much, they also invented beer. Because the Sumerian language is an isolate, meaning it's not related to the written or spoken language of any surrounding cultures, scholars have speculated that it's an offshoot of a Proto-Euphradian language, spoken by the Ubaidian people, the same group who absorbed the hunter-gatherers in the paradise of the Persian Gulf oasis, before retreating from the Great Flood to settle along the new shoreline. Sumerian legend describes a place called Dilmun, it is said to be a bright and pure paradise where sickness does not exist and people lived forever. So the waiting list for an apartment was probably pretty long. It also is full of abundant water sources that transformed a formerly dry land into a literal garden of the gods, where the mother goddess Ninhursag tended sacred plants and deities made their home. The mythical stories of Dilmun are recorded in such legends as Enki and the World Order, Gilgamesh, the Land of the Living, and the Sumerian Genesis. These stories are thought to have heavily influenced the concept of Eden recorded in the Old Testament. The real Dilmun encompassed Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, and the coastal regions of Saudi Arabia. Dilmun's people were at the center of commercial activities, including traditional agriculture and seafaring, which allowed them to control the Persian Gulf trade routes from 3000 to 800 BCE. Dilmun may have all the stories to prove it was Eden, but the Mesopotamian marshes have all the receipts in the form of geological and archaeological evidence. The marshes, which covered 6,000 square miles only a few hundred years ago, were even more vast in ancient times, providing a rich bounty for hunter-gatherers. The first Ubaid farming villages were established in these marshes by 6200 BCE. By 3800 BCE, the Sumerian city of Ur was established at the edge of the marshes. Archaeological excavations showed that Ur led Mesopotamia in terms of early urban development. Its wealthy citizens enjoyed a level of comfort not seen at the time in surrounding cities. Ur reached its peak by around 1750 BCE, when it built its great ziggurat and high city walls. 
but by 450 CE, it had been pushed north off the shores of the marshes by a buildup of river silt and was abandoned. The Marsh Arabs are descendants of Sumerians who once occupied Ur. They now live on floating islands and reed houses throughout the marshes and depend on fish, rice cultivation, and water buffalo for their livelihood. There were an estimated half million marsh Arabs before Iraq started draining the marshes for oil exploration and land cultivation in the 1950s. In the early 1990s, the population shrank further to about 20,000, when Saddam Hussein destroyed 90% of the marshes by diverting water directly into the Persian Gulf in an effort to flush out Shia Muslims among the marsh Arabs who had rebelled against him. It was a pretty lousy thing for him to do, but we all know how it ended for that guy. Since Hussein's fall in 2003, there has been an effort to restore the marshes, and many of the marsh Arabs have returned from exile in Iran. But progress has been slow. The restored water is now too salty to sustain buffalo, and a dam upstream in Turkey has further reduced the fragile water supply. However, beginning in 2016, the Mesopotamian marshes are recognized as a UNESCO heritage site. So maybe someday it'll be paradise again. So what do you think? Do you believe we may have found the Garden of Eden? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History. 